to thank everyone for all the thoughts and prayers. Um, I am much better, um, but and I certainly would have rather been here last week um, than in quarantine. So, but again, thank you so much for your thoughts and prayers. I have felt every single one of them. So, a couple of announcements for today. The children's pool party that is scheduled for this afternoon has been postponed to the last weekend of August, that's Saturday from three to six. More details will come the closer it gets. We also do have a children's retreat next weekend. We leave Saturday morning. We're gonna meet here at 8.30, it's a little early, but we're gonna meet here at 8.30. We're going to Atlantic Beach and we'll return sometime Sunday afternoon. If you four and up can come, if your child is interested and wants to come for those online and here, please let me or one of my children's um, team members know and we will get you signed up. There is no cost, just some spending money that you'll need to bring. Some other announcements this morning. I know that we do have, let's see, Elaine, is there one Meals on Wheels? Sorry, sorry. There's the Meals on Wheels coming up um, as well. See Miss Elaine for more information about that. And if um, for our offering this morning, you can come and put it in the offering plate up at the front, and you can also give online. So again, welcome to all who are here today and welcome to those joining us online. So now we are going to go into our psalm reading this morning. It's Psalm 49, verses 1 through 12. Listen to this, all you people. Pay attention, everyone in the world. High and low, rich and poor, listen. For my words are wise and my thoughts are filled with insight. I listen carefully to many proverbs and solve riddles with inspiration and a heart. Why should I fear when troubles come, when enemies surround me? They trust in their wealth and boast of great riches, yet they cannot redeem themselves from death by paying a ransom to God. Redemption does not come so easily, for no one can ever pay enough to live forever and never see the grave. Those who are wise must finally die, just like the foolish and senseless leaving all their wealth behind. The grave is their eternal home, where they will stay forever. They may name their estates after themselves, but their fame will not last. They will die, just like animals. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if we can all stand and sing, We Bow Down, hymn number 154. Those who trust in their riches will wither, 
but the righteous will flourish like green leaves. Again, this is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. We want to go to the Lord in prayer now, and uh, I've been chatting with Graham by text, and wanted, he wanted me to thank you for the calls and the prayers. He's doing a lot better. His mobility is still somewhat uh, questionable, but his pain has subsided quite a bit. Uh, he wanted me to tell you that he appreciated all the offers to do things for him, but he didn't have that many jobs. And so uh, 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 let's continue to remember uh, him and uh, Gina and the boys uh, as he's recovering. We also want to remember those on our uh, prayer list this morning, uh, as we do every day. Uh, I want to uh, invite us to, as I've shared in the past, to just take a moment uh, to have some silent prayer. And I invite you to pick one or two, maybe three names off of here, and take a moment and pray specifically uh, for those individuals, if you will. Uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. here today, Father, as an expression of love to you, to gain strength from you as well as from each other. We do bow down and we worship you, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you for all that you have done for us these past days. We thank you for allowing us the opportunity to move about freely. But Lord, we're struck by the fact that there's so many who are part of this congregational family, a part of this community, or even a part of this world who cannot do that due to restrictions on freedoms, due to health issues, Lord, we pray for these folks. We ask you to be with them. Lord, to, to open up doors of freedom for them. Father, to touch and heal those that are struggling with physical issues. That you will make and help those around these who are physically struggling and emotionally struggling to be your presence in their lives. Through a call, a text, visit, a willingness to run errands or do other tasks, that these who are ill or otherwise physically unable to do, that those needs can be met. Father, we ask you to be especially with Graham and Gina this week as he continues to recover. Lord, we thank you for his leadership here. Father, we thank you as we, in her absence, celebrate Catherine's anniversary. We thank you for her leadership on staff as she ministers through music. We thank you for all of those in this church who assume leadership responsibilities. And Father, those who make themselves available to be about the ministry of this church. Lord, we ask that you be with us now as we continue this time of worship, that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive your word today. And Father, may it, may we look at it and hear it directed toward each of us, including myself. Help us not to deflect to somebody else that we subconsciously or consciously say, I wish they were here to hear this. For the word today is for each of us. We thank you for those who are joining us by Facebook and YouTube. And Father, I pray that you will bless them as they share this time via the internet. Lord, bless us now as we continue, guide and direct in all that's done here, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you would, please stand with us and sing along.
can just move that out of the way. How are you this morning? Margaret, what am I wearing? What is this? A crown, absolutely. What does a crown mean? Why am I wearing a crown? Why am I wearing a crown? Because I'm a king? A queen? Yeah. Now, if I'm a queen, that means I get to make rules, right? Hmm, what kind of rules should I make, Ivy? I'm going to make you talk this morning. What if you were wearing the crown and you were the queen for the day? What would be your number one rule you would make? Don't litter. That's a good one. All right, Kenna, what about you? To pray? Y'all are good this morning. Those are very good rules. Margaret Grace, would you make a rule? More cookies. More cookies. Absolutely. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> rules are good things. And do you know that Jesus has one called the golden rule? Do y'all know what that is? No? The golden rule is to love each other as you would love God. Even the people who get on your nerves and you don't like, meaning when your brother gets on your nerves, you still have to love him. When mom or grandma or granddad get on your nerves, you still have to love them. Margaret, that goes the same for you too. When Sam is pestering you, you have to love Sam too. You have to love people. That's the number one rule. Love people like God wants you to love. Like he loved you. If we all did that, and we put the anger, the hurt aside, and still loved, the world would be a much better place. That's what God wants, is the world to be a wonderful, loving place. But we have to make it that way. And we start by loving each other. So that's what I want you guys to do this week. When you're going through your week, and you get upset over whatever, at whoever, remember that you love them. And show them love. Don't show them that you're upset. So when maybe dad or mom tells you you have to clean your room and you don't want to, you respond with, yes, I absolutely will. And I love you. Okay? Same for you. So when somebody, and for the whole congregation, really. That's your challenge this week. Love instead of hurt and anger. So let's pray. Fear to God, thank you so much for giving us the ability to love. Help us to remember that love is ten times more powerful than any hurt or anger that we could have. And that when we push that love forward and show it, we'll make the world a better place in your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go this way. <laughs> yeah. I think more cookies is a good rule. <laughs> Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke. I'll be reading from the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 13 through verse 21. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, him being Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he, Jesus, said to the, the individual, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is being demanded of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but not, are not rich towards God.
the gospel of Christ. Praise his holy name. I'm sorry it's because Graham physically can't be here. I'd a whole lot rather fill in for him when he's there at the beach or on a trip or something like that, but um, to celebrate he's doing much better. Before I get into this, let me kind of share with you what we've been up to. Not much. Now, that I've covered that, um, no, it, we... Uh, <coughs> you follow what I put on Facebook, and some of it you probably don't even care about, but that's okay. We've been in Boone this week, because Tyson had uh, Little League All-Stars, eight-year-olds up. Now, if you want to watch an exciting ball game, you go watch eight-year-olds up play All-Star baseball. Um, but I guess the, the, uh, the most uh, impactful time was when we left Boone on Friday to come home, it was 72 degrees at two, at three o'clock in the afternoon. And we got here, well actually we stopped somewhere in Greensboro or somewhere, I opened the car door and it was like, Phew. you know, almost turned around and went back. But um, I've been sharing around with some different churches, uh, uh, that's 
Stansburg occasionally and here today in Presbyterian Church next week and I'll be in speaking at Murfreesboro Baptist Church on the 14th and the 21st. So appreciate your prayers as we uh, ride the circuit, so to speak. <laughs> this passage I read from Luke is interesting because I've heard it preached many times growing up, and I'm sure you have too, and um, most of the time the focus to me is on the wrong thing. Most of the time we hear uh, sermons criticizing the rich guy. Uh, and, you know, the, the parable is, is true. I mean, it, 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 it makes a good point. But I think we miss something in the story. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. You see, the issue here in this text, to me, is not ownership of possessions, but it's ownership by possessions. And the fact that wealth can be a hard taskmaster. The person who desires wealth is always tempted and many times gives in to acquiring more and more and more, and that becomes the priority, which is the point of the parable. The person who has wealth is tempted to devote his or her life to guarding and growing that wealth. Now that's not a bad thing, depending on the context and who the person is and the motivation. For we are cult culturally taught and we tend to believe that we can find security. We all save, I did, you do. We all save for our retirement. And we bristle at the thought that somebody's gonna mess with it, right? For many, However, faith in wealth crowds out faith in God. You see, it's not the money that's the problem. It's the love of the money. Paul writes Timothy in 6.10, 1 Timothy 6.10. Tony Campolo tells a story about a trip to Haiti with his 17-year-old son. And they were walking down one of the streets in the uh, city of Port-au-Prince, the capital, and they found themselves surrounded by a whole group of impoverished, ragged children begging for pennies. Campolo cautioned his son not to give them anything because he said, the kids won't stop until they get every dime you're, you had. His son turned, 17 year old son turned and looked at his dad and said, so? So? But what constitutes greed? And is it wrong to be self-satisfied like the rich man? To become lazy, to fail to see or become unconcerned about the needs of those around us? And many times taking on a judgmental attitude about those around us? Well, these are all valid questions that need to be addressed. I, like I said, I want us to focus our attention on just one verse from the text, and that's the last verse I read, verse 21. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Rich towards God. What does that mean? What do you think it means? I won't ask you to respond. It's rhetorical. What do you think it means to be rich towards God? Let's explore, explore that for a few minutes. In Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus instructs us in verse 1, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. The notion being you have received your reward because everybody's telling you how great you are. Then down in verse 19 to 21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Some would suggest, and I tend to believe this, that those treasures that Jesus is talking about are really, and parenthetically, let me, let me insert here, when we think about mansions and, and, and treasures and all of that, crowns and jewels and all that kind of stuff in heaven, we tend to think materialistically, you know? 
God's going to give me this crown. It's going to have all these diamonds and rubies on it, and I'm going to walk around looking like the one Holly wore, only fancier. I don't believe that's it at all. I don't believe that has anything to do with it. You see, I think the treasures and the crowns and the jewels and all of those word pictures that Jesus paints have to do with those who have come to faith in Jesus as a result of our actions here on earth. Being Jesus to others instead of focusing on ourselves like the man in the parable. Verse 24 of that chapter says, No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. Jumping down in verse nine, uh, chapter 19 of Matthew, Jesus says to the disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I will tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, Then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are impossible. Now people hear that verse and they run over it, just like the text from Luke. We run over that last verse that talks about being rich towards God and we focus our attention on the guy who built the barns and his greed. Here, we do the same thing. Well, rich people can't go to heaven. Jesus didn't say that. He did not say that, that those with wealth will not enter the kingdom of God. He said that if they're counting on their wealth, it is impossible. Then the important statement follows, but with God, all things are possible. In other words, to refute the songwriter, you can't buy a stairway to heaven. Jesus is telling the brother in Luke, and us, I believe, that we are to be rich towards God. To me, that is the focus of that parable. It may not be for you, but I hope that after we finish this morning, you'll rethink that a little bit. The young man was afraid his brother was cheating him in regard to the inheritance. He wanted Jesus to step in and straighten his brother out. He was trying to get Jesus triangled. You ever been triangled before? So-and-so really said something. Can you talk to them? No. You talk to them. You got a problem with your brother? You talk to them. Now, Jesus didn't say that. He said, who made me the judge or arbitrator over you? Being, a, being in a triangle situation is not a good place to be because eventually you're going to be attacked from both sides if you're not careful. But back to the focus. So how does one become rich towards God? I'm going to suggest quickly five ways that we can become rich towards God. First of all, we need to be rich in love. If we're rich in love, we will not be covetous because covetousness is directly opposed to God's greatest commandment. And what was that? That is not rhetorical. What was God's greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. But before you do that, what do you do? You love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, and the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then we have this discussion about who's my neighbor. It's not the guy or the lady next door. It's anybody you come in contact with anywhere you go. Covetousness is only interested in getting. Love is only interested in giving. A covetous person often gives very sparingly and grudgingly to help others because their bank balance in love is not very high. So if your balance, your bank account of love is low, build up a good supply. And then build up a wealth of good work, a wealth of good ministry resulting from that love. Treasure up every opportunity you have to show God's love and do good to other people. Be rich in love. Another kind of wealth I think God regards as true riches is faith. Be rich in faith. James 2.5, listen, my, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? So what does it mean to be rich in faith? 
person who's rich in faith puts full trust in God. Full trust in God. They depend on the Lord for all their needs, not just the physical ones, but also the need for wisdom, for direction, and the power to live and to serve him and other people. They're dedicated followers of the Lord, going wherever the Lord leads and doing whatever the Lord wants them to do. I told you the story about us going to seminary when I was in Morganton. The only thing we had in Wake Forest was a place to live. I had no job, nothing. The last day, the last sun, my last Sunday at Mount Home Baptist Church in Morganton, we went home for lunch after the service, and I had no job, and we were leaving the next day to go to Wake Forest. I got a call during lunch from a pastor in a little church in Chatham County, I'd sung a solo there on our way to taking a bunch of our junk to Maryland to pawn off on my parents. <laughs> and the gentleman said, we voted, we voted to call you as our mission project. We're going to pay you X amount of money a week to work with our music and our youth, and we've got a house we're going to give you to live in. So we were leaving the next morning regardless. I figured I sat groceries for four years in college. I could do it again, although you don't sack groceries anymore. It's willing to go where God tells you to go. It's trusting him to figure it out. Our problem is we want to figure it out and we get in the way. And then we wonder why it's all messed up. If we just get out of the way, you know, and go down the path God has for us and not keep asking so many dumb questions, we'll get where he wants us to be. If you look at your bank account of faith and it's kind of low, what should you do? You do what the Father said in Mark 9, 24 when he prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Or what the disciples did in Luke 17, 5 when they asked, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Or what we read in Hebrews 12, look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We need to be rich in love, we need to be rich in faith, but I think also we need to be rich in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1, 9 and 10 says, for this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. How do we become rich in the knowledge of God? It's very easy. It's crazy easy. We read God's word. We spend time alone with God in prayer. We do what we talked about several years ago on Wednesday night when we, we did that study on, I don't know if you remember or not, how to eat your Bible. You put yourself in the story. You become one of the men in the crowd holding a rock, getting ready to stone the woman taken in adultery. You become one of the disciples who's standing off watching and listening to what Jesus does in that case. You smell the smells. You look, you, you feel the dust in the air. You put yourself in the story. And then it comes real to you. And you try, to, you try to experience those feelings you might have had had you actually been there at that event. You see, as believers, I believe we have to become wealthy in the knowledge of God, a wealth of unfathomable riches. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how incomprehensible his ways. fourth way I think to be rich towards God is to be rich in life to be rich in life the second part of John 10, 10 says I come that they might have life and have it abundantly again our cultural notion of abundance if we're not careful turns into materialistic thinking you ever see these posts on there you know Type amen and all your bills will be paid. Why do we think 
God's going to give us money. Why do we think he's going to do that? He doesn't do it because he knows what we'll do with it. We'll be just like the rich guy in the parable I just read about. We'll think, oh, I won the lottery. I can quit my job. I can buy this, that, and the other, and I can, you know. That's not what it's about. It's not about being lazy. It's about being used by God. But we got this idea that, you know, and we hear it preached. I mean, you know, turn on, turn on TV. Watch some of these guys. Send me $100, and I'll send you a blessed dime. And all your bills will be paid. To me, that's heresy. And it's heretical. But how do we relate to Jesus' word in an everyday, abundant life? What is he talking about? I think we get the, the gist of it from the context of what Paul wrote in Philippians. First chapter 1, verse 21. For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. There it is. Living is Christ. Dying is gain. Chapter 3, verse 8, more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, as garbage, in order that I may gain Christ. Chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then that verse that many claim is their own. But a lot of times we fail to live it. 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul is speaking of living a life of qualitative, not quantitative, abundance. A life lived for Jesus Christ. A life that draws all of its joy, its power, and its love from him. Measured in terms of his involvement in our lives. Not with dollar signs or accumulation of stuff. Living life, the abundant life. And finally, we can be rich towards God by being rich in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 5.58 says, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Matthew 6, says, But strive first, seek ye first, some translations say, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek ye first. Seek God first. Let him direct your path. And all these things will be given to you as well. Again, not necessarily money. We got to get off of that. We got to get off of that. In the classic Peanuts comic strip, Charlie Brown goes to Lucy for psychiatric help. He says, what do you do when you don't fit in? What can you do when life seems to be passing you by? Lucy leads Charlie away from her booth and says, follow me. I want to show you something. See that horizon over there? See how big the world is? See how much room there is for everybody? Have you ever seen any other worlds? Charlie Brown meekly says, no. Lucy continues. As far as you know, this is the only world out there, right? Charlie Brown again meekly says, right. Lucy continues to press on. There's no other worlds for you to live in, right? Charlie Brown <laughs> admits, right. You're born into this world, right? Right, says Charlie Brown. Then Lucy explodes. Then live in it then. Five cents, please. While we, while we may disagree with Lucy's counseling methods, we recognize that she's on to something. We need to make the most of our lives and really live an abundant life being rich towards God being rich in love, rich in faith. Brad, you can go to that next slide if you will. Being rich in knowledge, experiencing the abundant life in Christ. I would like for us to read 
what you see on the monitors together. Here we go. So may we commit ourselves today to strive to become rich towards God by living a life rich in love, rich in faith, rich in our knowledge of God, rich in experiencing the abundant life Jesus seeks of, and rich in investing our time, talent, and treasures in God's kingdom and world. May it be so. Let's pray. God, help us to become rich toward you and not gauge our lives based on the quantity of the possessions we have, but rather on the quality of the abundant life offered to us from your son, Jesus Christ. And may we be willing to render all our resources to help meet the needs of others in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together Blessed Assurance. It'll be on the monitors, but it's also hymn number 572. If you're here today and you need to make a decision, I will be here at the front to receive you and to pray with you. Or you may do that where you're standing. But I pray that you'll let God lead during this, these moments. Let us stand together as a claim comes and leads us. presence this morning. It's, it was good to be here. I pray you'll have a great week and that you'll look for opportunities um, to grow richer towards God as you move in and out of your daily lives, interacting with others. Um, look for those opportunities. Be sensitive to them. Uh, don't, don't just walk by them. And now as we go, may we go in the peace and love that only comes through Jesus Christ. And may we be arbiters and transferers of that love as we move about the days ahead. In Christ's name, amen. Go in peace. <clears throat>